good morning good evening um, i guess um, from wherever you are joining this webinar uh, welcome everyone my name is raj kasturi and um, today's topic is going to be is uh, scrum a good fit for solving big data challenges uh, this is a topic that um, has been um, uh, dear to my heart and uh, i have worked in big data as well as in the scrum um, my name is Raj Kasturi, and I have um, about 25 years of IT experience in the uh, big, uh, I mean, overall experience as uh, working as an enterprise uh, agile coach, uh, as a scrum trainer, as well as a scrum master. I worked in the big data space uh, for a large cable telecommunications organization, and I have uh, also helped that uh, company transform to agile. I also am a faculty member at uh, Pennsylvania State University in Pennsylvania. Um, I've been teaching there for the past 19 years or so, and I've also taught uh, technology courses like um, database administration as well as project management, Scrum, and any of the Agile courses. So I'm a technical person myself uh, because I started my career as a, a developer. I've also worked as a database administrator, uh, so uh, I've been, you know, I'm exposed to the technology aspect as as well. Um, and this topic might, in, you know, not be, we might not go too deep into technology, uh, although, um, you know, many of you might have uh, some technical experience, um, and some of you will have a combination of technical as well as project management, but we'll touch upon those points and balance the webinar in such a way that we focus on the big data aspects, what is happening in the industry, and if Scrum is a good fit or not. So that's ultimately, we want to figure out, you know, what has worked in my experience and what the current industry trends are. Um, so the agenda for today uh, is going to be uh, a few topics that covers every everything about big data and Scrum, um, essentially the foundations of that. So what is big data uh, is the foundational uh, topic. And then talk about the three big Vs of big data um, and also the industry trends of 2017 uh, that was uh, produced by Tableau. Um, and um, uh, this was done in 2016, but I just wanted to bring that out to the audience to see how those trends have actually happened um, uh, halfway through 2017 and you know, on an ongoing basis as well. Uh, we'll finally look at the Agile spectrum to do this, um, and or uh, if Scrum would be beneficial uh, to, to do the work. I'll also talk about the complexities and challenges of um, big data and how empirical process control theory would help um, with solving these issues, uh, and if they would solve those problems, or you know whether it is worth it to pursue uh, any of these agile philosophies. Um, ultimately, Scrum and big data. I want to bring the big data trends back at that point of time uh, to discuss the details of the top ten trends of 2017, um, and then do a quick summary. So, with that, um, let's get started with the. First topic, uh, what is big data? Well, uh, the term big data was coined in the late 1990s. Um, I was always used to the word data. And um, you know, how is it different from big data? Uh, data is data, right? You know, that's what we think, uh, or that's what we assume. But big data is different than regular data. Um, so we have, um, Billions of data sets and their interaction that's happening at this point of time in any organization uh, and with uh, the global interaction that we have on the internet uh, with several different corporations, I would say the the challenges have been um team and each uh, organization is coming up with their own um, their architecture to solve the big data problems and making sure that you know we have the return on investment for the products that we are creating and um, 
especially data is uh, so big and so important that even government uh, organizations or governments have been tracking information. Uh, as you can see, uh, in, I know some of you are from uh, India or you know wherever you are. Uh, I think the Indian government working on uh, big data efforts to get their um, other card, PAN card, or you know, unique identification numbers um, that Nandan uh, has been working on. Um, so, I mean, when when data comes to my mind, the one thing that I feel is big data is different from regular data, um, and as it's been traditionally said, um, the, when you hear the word data, you can assume that this term refers to traditional data that is handled and stored using old technologies. Uh, remember the, the 90s or the, even the early 2000s, and even now, like, you know, we have that. Um, the traditional relational database management systems and uh, data warehouses. But how is that different from big data? Uh, big data is different because it requires uh, new data platforms, uh, especially with storage. Um, of data, handling of the information that we have, and also the processing requirements. So essentially we are saying that the term big data refers to an entirely new technology paradigm. And um, you know there's a lot of uh, pieces to this puzzle. And before we get into deeper discussion, uh, we need to understand the nature of the data um, and uh, also what that data is useful for. Um, one of the things that comes to my mind, I actually uh, just Googled or on, and then I found something on Wikipedia. And what does big data mean? Like, you know, when, when I looked at the relational database management systems where um, you have the normalization of the data that, that has happened on your databases, and you do a select star and you get um, a result or an output of the data. Um, and essentially, uh, um, I was used to, or at least you know, in the past, we were used to the um, bytes and bits and bytes and kilobytes. And um, I think the gigabyte part of it was like you know early on, you know, um, in in the late uh, 90s. You know, as the data grew from um, bits to bytes to kilobytes to gigabytes uh, exponentially, and the scale of big data has gone up like so much. So we have the gigabytes and the terabytes, petabytes, uh, exabytes, and zettabytes and yottabytes. So this is all the progression of and scale of big data that we are talking about. When, when I look at the gigabytes, um, just to give you an idea of what this meant, you know, my Google search this morning resulted me that with gigabyte is almost like pickup truck um, filled with paper. paper. So imagine all the paper uh, that can fit into a pickup truck, uh, and you know all the printed material that you have is that that's almost like a gigabyte of data. And a terabyte, I believe they said, is like fifty thousand trees worth of paper, fifty thousand trees worth of paper printed um, back and forth. And a petabyte is like almost like a uh, two petabyte is equal to all U.S. academic research libraries that we have. So amount of data is phenomenal. It's just unbelievable that a two petabyte can hold that much of, um, I mean, that much of information, like all U.S. academic research libraries. And one of the things that was interesting was um, exabytes, uh, five exabytes of information is all the words ever spoken by any human being. So I think, you know, it's probably the, I don't know if it is ongoing, uh, it could be, um, but uh, that's just, you know, the, the amount of information that we have. The information is not just in the, in, in, you know, in just a spoken language, uh, it's printed material, it's uh, streaming, it's video, it's uh, audio, uh, anything to do with data, anything to do with information is, is all considered to be um, big data. So um, that is big data. So new platforms are being built to meet the storage and performance requirements because for 
from a data point of view, we want information in split seconds, where when I do a search, um, uh, you know, whether businesses or whether uh, I'm an internet user, we want information as quickly as possible at our fingertips. Because based on that information, we make decisions, and it's important to have that kind of uh, uh, performance. So I, it, I think in terms of storage, in terms of variety, in terms of velocity, all of these, uh, the information sets that we have are very, very important for us to make informed decisions. Um, ultimately, it's information which is very, very powerful. And I think information is, on the other hand, we can call it as knowledge as well, right? So, um, you know, how do you apply this knowledge to uh, make decisions uh, after we do some analysis? Um, so the big uh, data Vs, the three Vs of big data, uh, is considered to be volume, velocity, all these factors are required uh, to kind of drive the need, but when you really look at it, do we really need all the three factors? Even if you have one factor that needs to be added or considered, um, I mean, there, there may be a need. You know, if you have a large amounts of volumes of data, do we need all of this information? Can we like mine this data or extract this data or make it really, really in a usable format. You know, how can we send this volume of data in small pockets of information so that we deal with it in a, in a measurable, manageable way to do it? A uh, variety of data. We have information variety, right? You know, there's a lot of science information. There's a lot of human information. There's a lot of business information. Uh, I mean, you talk about it, there's a variety of information that is, uh, that is needed. So, how do we handle variety? Um, velocity, at the, at the speed at which the data is flowing, you know, how much do we need, you know, what kind of information do we show um, or do we need to look at uh, becomes um, an important aspect as well. So uh, these are the three Vs that are important when we are dealing with big data. Uh, one of the things that I look at it from uh, from that is, I mean, do we need all the three uh, data points? Not real presence of any of them can drive the technology need or the big data need. Um, volume is distinguished by its scale, right? The data volume is relative in that that's, uh, it's not specific to uh, the amount of data, big data versus conventional technologies. Uh, but a good guideline is that if you're Organization owns at least one terabyte of data, then you need that um, volume to justify your deployment of that data. So at least one terabyte of data. Uh, the second aspect of it is velocity, characterized by you have your batch real time data or streaming data, right? That's like you, you have it in the IT from 30 kilobytes per second, 30 kbps up to range, that also tells us that I think you know, we need, uh, we can justify that there, there's a big data need um, or deployment need for the organization. Uh, just the rules of thumb or like, you know, just uh, some information to go by. I'm sure I think you know, a lot of you know about this, um, but I think you know, it's, technology is one thing, but we always underestimate the big data aspect of it. We think that data is data, but there's, there's a lot going on when we are making decisions, when organizations make that call to say, hey, we need to um, adopt the big data technologies. We need to transform ourselves into big data technologies. How do we do that? Um, and uh, finally, we have variety of information. Uh, so uh, the big data deployments are also characterized by high variety of data. Like I mentioned before, um, any combination of structured, semi-structured, unstructured uh, data types uh, do those three Vs, which is the fourth V, uh, value, right? 
um, essentially what we're talking about here is um, what is the use of all of these things if it doesn't really provide value, right? Value is something um, that's an output or an outcome of um, solving those three. It's important to have this because without business value, what's the point of doing something? I think um, some of you who are in the agile adoption phases uh, and also solving this big data problem using either Scrum or uh, XP or um, uh, Kanban, I think what we are talking about here is you know, why do we do anything with business value? Not just using one framework like Scrum. Uh, it's also about talking about uh, what is the value from a traditional sense, right? You know, we, we, we want some return on investment when we work on any project. So our business folks um, or corporation uh, product owners, everyone is involved in making sure that the return on investment is high on anything that we work on. And especially with data nowadays, uh, this has become, or this is the backbone of everything that we do. And um, so that becomes very important to add this uh, fourth V in my opinion. And big data is uh, low value in raw form, right? You know, so we look at data and we say, okay, you know, I have rows of information or columns of information. I have some Word documents. I have some videos. It's, it's all in raw form, but the value is really low in raw form. But once you process that information and reduce that information, redu reduce meaning, I'm saying that we are mining that data and saying, hey, this is really valuable for me. You know, filter that data to make it the best and then give that information so that it's used in, in that form. And it's rolled up, boiled down, cleaned up. Anything that you want to uh, aggregate and it's useful to generating like high value, uh, that's what is uh, key for us to, uh, to work on. So. Um, that's about the, the, the four Vs that I wanted to talk about from a data point of view. As you can see, uh, we, we are building on the knowledge that we have so far about the big data uh, transformation. So these, th these three things are important from a volume, velocity, variety point of view, but we also need the value that needs to be provided when we solve those three problems after we justify why there's a need, there's a business need. Um, and what kind of value we are going to provide uh, when we transform ourselves with uh, big data, data platforms. Um, one of the examples that comes to my mind is in 2009, uh, in the US, we had the H1N1 flu epidemic, and all over the world, people were uh, flying from different places. Um, so Google had created a flu tracker um, at that point of time. It was very important to have some information as quickly as possible. The big thing is before people would go on, um, go to the doctors or go to the emergency room or you know anyone who suffered from the flu weren't sure whether it's a traditional flu like the normal flu or the H1N1 flu, right? You know people would not really know based on the symptoms. You know what are the symptoms? So essentially, I think the search queries were super optimized. They were accurate and. Um, real-time data that we had. Um, so when I look at this information, it's almost like um, um, the CDC or the uh, Center for Disease Control was also using the same thing, using traditional sampling, but Google's method was more accurate. So it, they had a huge advantage in controlling the outbreak. Uh, uh, so, I, you know, in knowing the what was important rather than why are we doing this because the, the epidemic, it was so big uh, in terms of the epidemic that people needed information accurately, instantly, as quickly as possible. So the data was far more effective and they had 3 billion searches a day on Google. And imagine uh, the amount of uh, servers and the algorithms that needed to be tweaked and the performance, everything was taken care of by using uh, big data, um, you know, search algorithms and sorting of the data and uh, using infrastructure to support this kind of uh, um, uh, uh, work that needed to be done. 
So essentially, I think you know that's what was done. But Google also employed um, uh, you know uh, a lot of agile philosophy uh, to do this, and then that continuous integration um, was very important because you know Google has so much data uh, that they were dealing with that everything on the net had to be uh, in in such a way that it um, it needed to be um, you know tracked uh, using all the whatever available technology was at that point of time uh, but i think you know we have a lot of um, interesting trends that have happened since uh, we have come above and beyond that at this point of time um, in 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 a lot of organizations so essentially i would say i think this is where we have uh, google's flu tracker that was um, successful and um, sort of a trend that they had created at some point to, um, you know, come up with a lot of uh, technologies and uh, things are in the cloud now. Um, you know, a lot of organizations like uh, big companies who deal with big data, uh, the big ones, you know, obviously Google, Oracle, and all the uh, organizations have um, set a trend to this. And, you know, several tools have also come out uh, on doing that. So who uses this data? Um, we talk about financial companies, telecommunication companies, energy, uh, government, scale, and many more. Like I said, the need of those possible ranges of data in terms of volume, velocity, and variety, any of those needs are there in an organization. The, it's, it's important to uh, transform and get to that um, next level of big data transformation. Um, so financial services are uh, using big data analytics and predictive trading algorithms, you know, obviously for a competitive advantage um, that these methods generate. And they, are, uh, they can make better informed investment decisions, like clients can do that, and enjoy more consistent returns. So I think especially people who are in the trade market or you know, essentially they want information at their fingertips. So financial services are um, doing that from that point of view. Uh, so you, you see a lot of um, analysis, um, real-time data that's helpful to make those decisions. How is the stock market doing today? Um, how are we trending towards the financial aspects of the market? Uh, is it worth for me to invest in it? Comparison charts to everything else that are useful in making that decision. Um, and the the second biggest, or at least uh, you know, it's equally important is the telecommunications area. Uh, they use big data analytics to combat fraud, um, and also they create a 360 degree customer view. So they want to increase the customer satisfaction rate and um, decrease churn. So essentially, uh, telecommunications companies focus more on customer satisfaction because there's uh, towers being built all over the place just to make sure that uh, you know phone calls and the quality of those go really well you know tracking information from GPS point of view to you know there's a lot lot that goes on as you know um, and, and um, so telecommunications are important and energy uh, companies uh, oil and gas companies have been using big data analytics uh, Internet of Things, IOT, right, to reduce operational and financial risks. Um, so just the proactive maintenance and equipment failures. So they can increase the uh, production rates, downtime incidents, etc. And government uses uh, public sector big data technologies, um, national governments, local governments, like state governments and um, townships to every everybody else like the local municipalities can also use that and so to optimize labor costs through employee and contractor productivity uh, monitoring so that's also another big area uh, especially when government workers are involved and um, um, last but not the least is uh, retail we have um, a lot of retail um, by optimizing like supply chain management um, it's also used to increase revenues um, by extending their customers, um, personalized offers and promotions, 
through electronic in-store um, couponing. So we have um, you know, get get online coupons or like in-store coupons. And pretty much, I think we are done with um, uh, at least in the U.S. We see um, the printed coupons are all. I mean, still in still valid, but I think a lot of them are online transactions either through Amazon or uh, in-store, like you know whatever stores that they have, they provide this data so that it's valuable. And use the five percent off, ten percent off uh, discount coupon. And you know, airlines is another industry uh, where all of this is happening. So I think that there's several different websites have uh, been uh, using this data to their advantage. And I think you know, in the past, I you know, I used to go through when I used to travel, I had to call my travel agent to make my booking and everything. And obviously now you the information is at your fingertips and you just have to lock in that data to to buy your tickets as as instantly as possible so so there's a lot of people a lot of organizations a lot of different industries that are using uh, big data to their advantage now um, I want to quickly talk about complexity uh, this is a, a, a Stacy diagram that we use uh, in, in a in a scrum environment to talk about complexity. Um, projects that require, that, that are complex in nature, um, they, as you can see on the left side, you have um, um, on the axis here, like you know, technology is one, on one axis and requirements are on one axis. So I think technology is a big, uh, has a big impact on the work that we do. And the requirements, uh, whether it's business requirements or any requirements, um, you need to have some sort of an agreement uh, from a requirements point of view so that everyone is on the same page, right? The business is expecting something to be done, and the folks who are solving that problem using technology uh, need to be in agreement. So as you can see, I can say that close to agreement here on um, my pointing my um, arrow here, and also close to certainty. And if, if it is a simple problem to solve, uh, main, majority of the time, you know, you have, you're close to agreement and you're close to certainty. So there's not a whole lot of big technology required or like, you know, requirements gathering, things like that, because this is something that we have done it many times. It's simple. It's not difficult to uh, come up with a solution because everyone is on the same page. Now, the next level is when we get to the, the uh, higher, far from agreement and far from certainty on this axis here. And that makes it more like if things, requirements are complicated and technology is complex, how do you solve that problem? Um, so which makes it difficult, but it's still doable, right? You know, using your traditional methods of either waterfall or uh, any of those uh, uh, methodologies that you have used in the past. Now, anarchy is something where it's impossible to solve the problem, right? Um, essentially, what we are saying here is that's something that's beyond our reach. You know, it's so complex that the complexity is so severe and high, it's beyond complexity, which means that there's no immediate solution for that. We need to go through this, uh, figure out the complexity and everything before even we can touch that. So complexity is where it's far from agreement, and far from certainty. You don't know because you need some data to, to figure out if we can solve this problem or how to solve this problem, right? So that's where complexity comes into picture. And um, majority of the big data problems or big data challenges or any software development, all of those are complex. And I think they fall in this category. And, you know, the traditional methods have been um, working to a certain extent, but I think you know we ha we really haven't been successful uh, enough to do that using those kinds of methodologies. Um, so if you want to even put in complexity considerations, not just from a big data point of view, but any project that you work on, you have like multiple stakeholders, uh, ch changing requirements and business plan, unknown requirements and technology, and above all. Uh, your customers, you know, uh, their needs, you know, how do you know, you know, you, you need to gather that information accurately to see if this product would work or not. And finally, people, 
uh, people that work in an organization, people that you report to, people that you uh, work with. You know, there's a lot of complexity in terms of communication. Uh, so it's important to have um, that understanding that everyone is on the same page and you understand and agree that it's complicated. It's more than complicated. It's complex. So we need to um, use the right kind of uh, methodology or frameworks to um, to understand or solve those problems. Um, so that's about complexity. But um, before we get into um, Scrum, I wanted to quickly talk about the Agile spectrum. Um, so essentially what we are talking about here is uh, um, we are saying on the left side of the spe spectrum is a defined, um, uh, I mean, defined process. And on the right side of the uh, spectrum is the empirical process. Uh, we'll quickly talk about empiricism. Um, but what we are talking about here is in defined process, uh, where we said, you know, simple, right? You know, we, we are talking about simple uh, problems to solve. The problem is known um, and the process is well understood and the results are repeatable. I, I normally, when I give an example of this, I say that making pancakes um, or, um, you know, if, you, if you're in India, I think, you know, make, making dosas is just following a recipe. And uh, depending on the amount of water that you add to the dough and, um, or, or the, uh, before you make anything, uh, essentially, it's basically just, you know, repeatable process. So you make one pancake or one dosa or many of those just by following the recipe, right? So uh, following a recipe step by step, um, and then you have this input and the output. Input is where you're putting it on a stove and then frying a pancake. Uh, that is what is the process, and the output is uh, uh, a done um, pancake. Um, so this is something, uh, an example would be a uh, waterfall um, that we use. Um, and on the right side is the Agile, uh, either frameworks like um, uh, Scrum, uh, Lean Startup, uh, Extreme Programming, FTT, all the things that you have. In This is called, you, you just, the majority of these use the empirical process control, which is um, unknown, the underlying process is not well understood. It's complex. So going back to this framework here, it's complex. So we are saying that it's complex. It's iterative in the sense that you want to know, uh, gather this information to make any decisions. So uh, knowledge comes from experience, which means that, okay, let's just figure out what this means um, and then apply that data that we have to solve a problem. So uh, essentially, empirical nature is something that is used for uh, invention. Like, you know, I want to invent a new product, but there's nothing in the market. How do I do that? I need to work on it a little bit, get some feedback on it, gather some information, apply that data, and then uh, repeat that process. And each time when you repeat that, the information may be different, or the data points or the data outputs may be completely different. So you want to gather that information and use that as your knowledge points uh, to make decisions going forward. And it involves a lot of creativity and productivity. Um, and the example for something like this uh, that I use is a cure for cancer. Uh, a cure for cancer is not there yet, and um, a lot of scientists are working on that. So many data points in that, that they, it's just too hard to gather all of that information. But you can't come up with a drug like so quickly because it needs to be tried on uh, various different populations to see if that works or not. Because the, the data is so complex and what we are dealing with is a, a disease that's um, so difficult to cure. And that's where um, the empirical data is helpful. You know, time box it and, and figure out for some of you who are on the Scrum Agile frameworks, you know that um, it's always the, that data, that time box to figure out and then see what's working uh, and inspect and adapt. So that's where the 
the, the three pillars of empiricism are inspection, um, transparency, and adaptation. Those three are critical in making sure that, okay, I, I don't have any information, but I inspect and I adapt and then make sure that the information that is available is transparent to everyone so that we make informed decisions. So that's where the agile spectrum falls under. So when you're making your decision uh, about where do my projects fall under? I mean, is it something that needs crumb? Uh, I, I have my big data projects, and I know that uh, each one of these will require some in, some output of that. But the process, if it is not reasonably well understood, uh, do I need to use Scrum? Do I need to use um, XP? Um, or do I need to use something? I mean, some of it is repetitive, but when you're creating new tools, when you're processing the information, when you're uh, making performance improvements are done, there's a lot going on, so I think, you know, it's, it's, in my opinion, I think it's complex. So I would use you know, one of these, you know, agile philosophies. But for a traditional sense, from a database de development point of view, this was okay to have done, but even that, you know, people have figured it worked well with uh, any of the agile philosophies. Uh, just quickly checking on time here, I have the few more slides to go through. So um, if we look, and I'm sure you looked at this before, um, uh, what is a process? A process is an input uh, that goes in and uh, comes out in the form of an output. In the traditional sense, let's say I'm talking about a traditional relational database management system, and I put in a query, uh, select a few columns from the customer table, where, and then I put in a where criteria, and that becomes my input. And internally, we don't know yet. Uh, for, for my uh, normal user point of view, I mean, I don't, don't really know what exactly is happening, but I know that the output that comes out is dependent on what I put in here. So this might have internal processes that are happening. So that's where the process is. Um, now, we talked about the spectrum where we said on the left-hand side was the defined process, on the right side was the empirical process. And in this situation, the composition is uh, known and the characteristics are well-defined as an output uh, where we have sequential series of steps, the underlying process is well understood, the results are repeatable and predictable. It's a command and control approach where it's your controlling what you inputting here so that you, you can make sure that the characteristics of the output are defined well. Uh, and then predefined variations are acceptable. So which means that when we are making that pancakes, uh, you can say, okay, no, I, will, I can do uh, 30 seconds more of the frying of the pancake and uh, those variations are acceptable. But um, in, in, in the empirical process control, uh, which is formed in um, basically on the three pillars of empiricism are transparency, inspection, and adaptation. Um, so which means that observation, it comes from, uh, knowledge uh, comes from experience. And we have observation, experimentation, and experience. And as solution evolves, we gain some knowledge about that, and then you make decisions based on what is known at that point of time, which means I conduct an experiment for two weeks and figure out what the data points are, and then based on that, I use that data to make the next decision, okay? So uh, essentially, you know, for cancer cure, what we are saying is that observe, experiment, and experience, and then you make the decisions, and the next round, you adjust, you know, if you're doing an experiment, you know, I'm trying to come up with a drug, um, I want to reduce the amount of ingredients that go into this uh, drug um, or the percentage of something needs to go up, so on and so forth. So the three pillars of empiricism are transparency, inspection, and adaptation. Um, so process outcomes should be visible, uh, inspect and remove any un unacceptable variations, which means you can call it in from a technology point of view, software technology, we are removing um, variations, unacceptable variations, which is defects. Right, and then you adjust and correct the process. So 
how are we working together? Because this is a team of uh, individuals who are knowledgeable, motivated individuals who are working. Um, they have all the creativity, excitement to um, to create something new, and um, that's what they need is the empirical process control uh, that is used for um, big data projects. Um, empirical process control, as you can see, um, we talk, talk about, let's say, you know, quickly talk about Scrum. Um, Scrum is a framework and uh, uh, where we can uh, solve, address like complex problems. And you creatively and pr productively deliver those products that give um, the highest value. And Scrum is founded on the empirical process control theory. So Scrum, uh, the, the, the word, as you know, I'm sure some of you know, is, um, comes from rugby. And uh, it's a lightweight uh, framework. It's very simple to understand. But it's difficult to master because of all the uh, different data points that you have to go through uh, from a process as well as people point of view. Um, Frequently inspect and remove any um, unacceptable variations. So I consider this in Scrum, we use uh, the term sprint, um, as most of you know. And that sprint is something where it's a time box event, a start time and an end time. And it's repeated uh, just to keep it in, in regularity. Um, the same time, same things happen. Uh, for example, I look at this uh, as a black box. And there's inputs that we put in, uh, regulated, just to make sure that there's no uh, too many variations. But then there's outputs. But what happened in this situation here is pretty much unknown because we can't see it. Until the time I actually go through this piece of this black box and I know, OK, I think you know, I know more information at this point of time. Let's move on to the next one here. And then to the next, next, so on and so forth until you get the output. And you use this output as an input for the next time to ensure that we repeat this process and the results may be different. So the problem cannot be fully understood, but solution evolves as, you, as it becomes known. Um, I look at it this way. Uh, uh, Scrum, uh, as you know, has um, some predefined checkpoints like meetings. Uh, you have a planning meeting. You have a daily Scrum. Uh, sprint review and retrospective. So um, you want to make sure that uh, those are completed you know, within that sprint. And the inputs are some of the artifacts that we have, which is essentially the product backlog items. What are the um, items that give us the most return on investment? What is the problem that I want to solve? And that becomes an input here. And definition of done is one of the artifacts or one of the key of items that is not an official uh, artifact of Scrum, but it's an artifact that is useful uh, to make decisions. So how much work can we accept into this black box or this sprint? And then those become the completed sprint backlog items. So this process will be visible as you go along. And I'll show you um, that what the daily Scrum is, the sprint planning is. So essentially, look at this as a calendar. And you say that this is day one, day two, day three, day four, and day five. Um, so uh, yes, the answer is the sprint is a black box. Um, so if you look at this inspect adapt philosophy, as you can see, uh, predefined checkpoints that we said um, in Scrum are com you know, because of complex situ situations. We use that framework. And as you can see, the inputs are uh, product backlog items and a definition of done. And the green one is the sprint planning meeting that happens here. And once the planning meeting is completed, um, as you can see on day one, the black is all the black box items, which we don't know. But we went through day one. I know some information about um, the product that we are developing. So it became white. So I have some light at the uh, end of the day. And I inspect and adapt. I have some knowledge gained. I make decisions based on uh, what becomes clearer. And solutions evolve as, they, as this becomes clearer and clearer, and the process outcomes are visible. So we know exactly what is happening here. In day two, the same thing. You know, we have some information. We go through daily stand-up here, uh, daily scrum, 
and going through those three days. And essentially, I think at the end, you figure out how, whether your process is working or not and any improvements that need to be made. The same thing with people. Uh, do a sprint retrospective to get that done. So this whole thing needs to be protected because you don't want to um, mess up the data. Uh, you don't want the information to be uh, like uh, intact. So which means that you uh, don't add any new items that confuse the whole uh, sprint. So that's why we call that as uh, uh, protecting the black box, protecting the sprint. So uh, hence the term um, protecting the black box or the protecting of the sprint. So this is a one week sprint. Um, and um, so that, that's where you know decisions are made you know, as we have the inputs and outputs. So imagine all of the big data components that we are working on, whether it's a platform or uh, performance improvements or uh, any of the data the points that go in there, uh, it's so complex that you know you need to do this kind of an experiment to figure out if it is working or not. If they are working, keep doing it. If they are not working, keep improving. Inspect, adapt. And um, essentially, I also want to go through this one thing where um, you know, if you look at these popular platforms and tools that I want to give you quickly, um, when I worked in this organization, there's a lot of uh, tools and platforms that people are using, um, like Cassandra, Hadoop, uh, open source items. Um, and they have this, um, you know, Pig and Apache Hive. Uh, if you're a technical person, you probably know. I mean, I myself am not completely involved in uh, doing any development or anything. But I just understand the parts of where I have um, organized um, or worked with um, agile teams uh, in the transformation of that, and also with the big data transformation teams. So big data um, technology and then Scrum framework. You know, we are trying to combine both to figure out if we can come up with a good solution. So um, Hadoop system is um, essentially like um, distributed file system and I'm not going to go too deep into it uh, because of you know interest of time um, so the source is from managing big data workflows for dummies I have some um, references that I put at the end of this so if you are interested in more uh, in learning more about this you probably can go in there and look at that information as you can see this is the input data and then you have the outputs here but as you can see there's maps and reduces that can be uh, looked into um, uh, to to get the output done. So MapReduce is a batch processing framework um, and that performs distributed parallel processing tasks uh, that's stored in the uh, distributed file system, the uh, Hadoop system. Uh, it reduces the um, work by converting big data into smaller sets of tuples. So you basically take this and then these key values are sorted and then they make smaller chunks of that data and distributed through uh, to get these little outputs that makes um, um, gives you big value. So map task is where the data is delegated to the key value pairs. So this is where the value pairs are, and then um, transformed and filtered, and then assigned to these nodes that we have, uh, which reduces the nodes. So once it uh, the comes into the map node and key values are done, you reduce the nodes. And then finally, the reduce task is where the data is reduced uh, to tuples um, of a key value pair. So this is also uh, managed by task trackers um, and carried out to worker nodes. So essentially, I think that's the whole process that does, um, you know, some of you technology folks um, might understand this better than, uh, you know, obviously me, I'm, I have a high level understanding, but I've been away from coding for quite some time now. Um, but that's the Hadoop distributed file system. It's uh, essentially, I think, you know, one of the popular platforms and tools that we have been using. Um, and I'll take a few more minutes here by saying that uh, Scrum and big data. So I think, you know, our topic was, is Scrum a good fit for uh, solving big data challenges? And we we figured out that Big data, um, big data has challenges, complexity, 
and how do we solve those problems? I mean, because of all the velocity and uh, value that it needs to provide, I think you need to make sure that uh, it's it's done correctly. So Scrum's ability to measure the work output is velocity, so you know how much velocity is going to be driven. So this velocity that we are talking about in here is different than the velocity of um, the actual big data velocity. So I think, you know, for this is just the, the speed at which we are doing the work. The other velocity is, you know, obviously how much data is being moving from one place to the other. Pretty much the same concept, but the, the context is different. And knowledge is based on the ability to measure a given phenomenon. Um, so you basically, once you measure it, you can start to manipulate the input and then you determine if we have improved something uh, by the resulting output, uh, which is again, you know, inspect and adapt. So you will know it at only at the end when you have a um, shippable product increment. And so we have discussed the empiricism and Scrum um, is based on empirical process control, the, um, continuous improvement. Um, the that's where uh, I think, you know, just to look at the uh, very quick, and I, I have uh, um, provided a, a, a link at the end for you to go through this, um, the big data trends that um, were done in the, in the Tableau um, report that was provided. Often our big data becomes fast and approachable. Um, ex options expand to speed up Hadoop. So people want to know how, how fast. Business wants faster, more reliable information. So uh, there's a need for speed, uh, faster databases. I think something like Exosol and MemSQL are some of the products that are used. Um, there's Hadoop's, uh, Hadoop based Kudu uh, for fa faster queries and data warehouses and big data. So those, those are some of the things that are trending uh, in 2017. This report was for predicted or at least uh, thought about in end of 2000. Um, the second one is big data no longer just Hadoop. There's more than Hadoop, right? Customers are demanding more analysis on all data. So um, we are talking about, uh, we are becoming source thick and we are becoming more and more of uh, exiting of the platform. We are um, all data, I think, you know, not just, just Hadoop. Um, organizations leverage data lakes from get go to drive, drive value. So data lakes is, um, like a man-made reservoir, right? it's a lake, uh, and you dam the end or build a cluster, and then you let it fill with water, which is your data. So once you have the information, once you have the checkpoints that we have, then you do the predictive analysis and um, um, ML and cybersecurity, et cetera. So it's essentially regulating your water through the dam, and which is putting it in a cluster, and then let the water flow, which is your data flow, and then you put the valves and whatever needs to move from there. Um, the architectures mature to reject one size fits all framework, um, which is again, not just batch processing, um, but use cases. You want to respond to hybrid needs like use case specific um, architectural design. Now we talked about the three Vs and variety, not volume or velocity drives big data investments. So we have dealt with volume. We have been dealing with velocity, but now variety has become too much. There's a lot of variety of information that is available, variety of data that is available. So uh, we are working with those and making investments in those areas. Um, Spark and um, machine learning light up big data. So uh, it's becoming the platform of choice for enterprises. Um, Apache Spark is one. Uh, Microsoft Azure uh, machine learning language has taken off quite a bit this year. So I think those are some of the, the trends that are happening. Um, then the convergence of um, IoT, um, which is internet um, transactions. Data is being deployed on cloud services. Um, so you're looking at heterogeneous data, relational, non-relational, uh, from Hadoop clusters to NoSQL database, uh, which provides innovation. Uh, Self-service data becomes mainstream as end users begin to shape data. Um, so essentially, uh, agile self-service data prep tools, um, but snapshots are available fast 
for faster and easier exploration. So a lot of innovation is happening in this area. Big data grows up, um, adds to enterprise standards, which means uh, it's becoming a core part of enterprise IT. Uh, customers are expecting this from their, uh, you know, in, even in their relational database management systems now. And finally, uh, rise of metadata catalogs help uh, people find the analysis worthy of big data, uh, which is don't throw away data. Metadata catalogs can help with discovery and analysis. Um, so with self-service tools, you, that gap is filled. And um, I think companies like Alation and Waterline are using um, machine learning to automate work. That, that's the biggest trend that I, I'm seeing um, nowadays. Um, work that is with a fair degree of complexity uh, that requires innovation, requires invention, requires product differentiation, productivity, and faster launch to market. So I say that big data needs um, all of the above. And Scrum. So essentially, I think we are exactly um, out of time. Um, and um, I don't have uh, enough time for any questions. Sorry about that. Um, but what I can suggest is, if you don't mind sending um, any of your questions via email, um, or if you can send them here, uh, type them here. Uh, we'll collect those questions and figure out the next steps. I think uh, the easiest way that I'm thinking is um, maybe putting it on a, uh, on a blog or, or some place to answer those questions. Or maybe if there's a need for, for us to meet with answering some of the top 10 questions, uh, we can do a follow-up webinar uh, for doing that. But I'll, I'll, we'll figure that out later on. But let me take a look at those questions first, and then uh, I will get back to you. Uh, Yali, over to you. Thank you so much. Yeah, Raj, uh, we can do one thing. Uh, like, uh, I will create a thread on our discussion forum uh, with the name of this webinar. And uh, we will post one by one questions uh, with uh, your answers there. And we can share the link of uh, that thread on the social media things, LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, so people can come and see the answers of these uh, questions. That would be a great idea. I think you know, that will solve some of the... Yeah, and uh, I will share yeah, all I think, the you know, questions. Since we were out of time. Uh, <laughs> yes, we are yeah. actually out of time today. Okay, okay. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Raj. Uh, thanks uh, for sharing your thoughts. And uh, yes, uh, we got uh, some technical issues, actually, from my side only, the internet issues were there. Apologies for that. Yeah, okay. No worries. I think, you know, if hopefully people found this useful and uh, we'll get together again if there's a need for us to talk about big data. Yeah, sure. Or anything else. Okay, okay. Thanks, Raj, and uh, thanks, friends. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, for joining. Okay.